are in listen only mode. Welcome, and thank you for joining us. My name is Kate Kraft, and I'm the Executive Director of America Walks. And this is our second webinar focusing on community revitalization and equitable development. We have been exploring how walking advocates can make sure that the benefits of walkable communities are equally available to all community members. We want to make sure that strategies are in place that will ensure that existing community members are not displaced as this vitalization evolves and that locally owned businesses are supported. This past March, we brought you a webinar called Advancing Neighborhood Change Through Equity and Inclusion. And during that webinar, we shared strategies that community practitioners could use to promote affordable housing and examples of equitable development planning. For those unable to attend or that particular webinar, the link to the recording will be in the follow-up materials you will receive. Today, we're following that up with uh, and continuing the discussion as we explore with Jennifer Vey from Brookings Institute and Nate Storing from Project for Public Spaces, how innovation, inspiration, and economic opportunities are components of community design in our built environment. We will hear about the research questions being explored to understand these interactions and engage in a discussion on the on what walking advocacy can or is contributing to this job opportunity. Additionally, we will hear examples from the Prevention Institute's Rachel Bennett on how Los Angeles is promoting and creating equitable development in that city. And Maria Sippen from the Multicultural Mobility organization will tell us about a unique grassroots organization that is making sure racial, racial and social justice is front and center in transportation and development projects. Mobility justice is an emerging social justice focus and multicultural mobility has five years of experience in many examples that they're going to share with us. Before we begin, uh, we would want to make sure to that you can send us your questions and comments. Heidi, you want to tell people how to do that? Sure. So like Kate mentioned, we do want to make sure this is as engaging as possible. If you have a question or comment for any of the panelists, or if you're having any technical difficulties, you can enter it into the question box on your GoToWebinar control panel. We will get to as many questions as possible at the end of the hour and try to address those that we don't get to by email. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Heidi. So uh, let me just start with a question I know we're gonna be getting. Yes, we will be sharing resources, including the recording of this webinar with you after the webinar, so um, know that you will be getting that. So. Uh, and in addition, as you listen to this first presentation, please be sure to provide input uh, as you hear about what Brookings Institute is doing as they really want to make sure their results are useful. And the best way to do that is to make sure the work is framed to help you from the beginning. So with that, I'm gonna turn, turn it over to Jennifer and Nate to explain to us this new exciting possibility. Thanks so much, Kate, and good afternoon, um, or I guess I should say good morning to some of you. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here uh, with Nate today. Um, as Kate mentioned, I'm with the Brookings Institution and Nate is with Project for Public Spaces out of New York. And together with our team, we have been part of an effort called the Bass and Initiative, the Bass and initiative on innovation and placemaking, which has been a partnership between Brookings and PPS over the last ooh, almost two years now. So what, what Nate and I are going to do is 
sort of give the big picture framing of the issue to really look at how the roots of gentrification, particularly innovative economic development and investments in walkable quality places, can, with the right interventions, actually help promote greater economic opportunity. So to really understand gentrification, we need to be asking questions about where change comes from and what drives it, and then ultimately, who can actually own and participate in that change. And in order for communities to drive change, we need to focus on three different, different aspects. One, oops, sorry. How we prevent negative outcomes from externally driven change, um, how we then guide potentially positive outcomes from those changes, and that's a, a fair bit of what we're going to focus on today, and then how we empower internally driven change. So the what we want to focus on is really about the innovation economy. And the innovation economy today is really driven by processes that increasingly demand collaboration. And this means collaboration between large companies, small companies, entrepreneurs, small firms, um, and other actors in the economy. And what this collaboration is really doing is that it's changing the spatial geography of innovation such that the hyperlocal is really being increasingly valued. And we're, where we're seeing this happen is really in different types of concentrations of economic activity in urban areas. So this includes things like innovation districts, arts and creative districts, food markets, and other types of areas where you're seeing innovative activity really gather and connect in high, high quality places in new ways. And what's important about this is that this is, we're seeing a sea change in this geography of this type of economy. If you think about where the innovation economy was going back to the mid part of the last century, a lot of that activity was really happening in the suburbs, whether in suburban research parks or along office corridors. Now we're seeing that come back again into more urban areas because of the valuation of collaboration and high quality spaces. And that is, and, and, and it's creating these innovation hubs that are just bringing together a diversity of different types of innovation assets, place assets, and networking assets within these small geographies. But what then that this is really doing is offering new opportunities to connect people to that economy. So if you think about this economy growing up 20, 30 miles outside the city for many, many decades, reflecting those patterns of suburbanization, now that we're seeing a lot of this innovative activity and economic activity and job growth happening within urban areas, it really opens up new opportunities to connect people to the economy. In our work, for example, we found that about 57% of jobs in the Philadelphia Innovation District require less than a four-year degree. And what this means is you're seeing this kind of innovative economic activity but it's opening up jobs across the spectrum that now people can access due to far greater proximity to those jobs than they may have had in years past when they were growing up outside urban areas. But the key here is that while the growth is a prerequisite for greater economic opportunity, it won't happen without intentional efforts to really connect people in these neighborhoods to that economy. So following up on the Philadelphia example, while there's a burgeoning innovation district that's growing and with many different job opportunities that are continuing to increase, at the same time, this is a district that is surrounded by very deep levels of concentrated poverty that have been in existence for many, many decades. So those intentional efforts really need to take various shapes. One, there needs to be efforts to enact local hiring policies, cultivate relevant skill sets and connect workers to jobs. So again, this isn't just about saying the jobs are there and we hope that people are able to access them, but it's having the institutions, the intermediaries, the organizations within these enclaves of growth being very, very aggressive in their efforts to design the kind of policies, practices, and programs that can help local residents connect to those jobs. This happens to be an example from the West Philadelphia Skills Initiative which is an initiative of the University City District in Philadelphia 
that works with local anchor institutions to identify jobs that have very high turnover rates and then work with them to, de to develop curriculum to actually train people in the community within West Philadelphia specifically to be able to train for and then access those jobs. So rather than the jobs just being present and people being able to apply for those jobs in a sort of open market, this is really an attempt to one, solve a problem that these anchor institutions have in terms of turnover, and two, be able to connect residents then directly to those jobs, which serves the purpose of getting people into jobs that may not have had access to them before, but also helping to build trust in the community. It's also about focusing on local procurement programs that help, help bit local businesses develop. This happens to be an example from Hopkins Local in Baltimore, where I happen to live, but there are other examples, certainly out of Chicago, out of Philadelphia, um, out of New Haven, and many other anchor institutions, particularly, that are really examining their own procurement policies with the goal of helping local businesses tap into that buying power, that purchasing power that these very large institutions have, and also helping to build the capacity of a lot of those small businesses to be able to, to fulfill and meet the needs of the, of the anchor institutions. And the third piece here is about place, and I'm gonna pass it over to Nate, but before I do, I just wanna sort of reemphasize that, that as these innovation economies grow, what we're really seeing on the ground are new opportunities to engage people and get ahead of the curve of gentrification by opening up new opportunities through workforce, through business development, and through place and other means. So I'm gonna pass it on to Nate from here. All right, thanks, Jennifer. Um, so, you know, obviously an important part of, uh, of this, this strategy regarding innovation districts and other economic hubs is the fact that they're place-based. And so that means that uh, engaging the surrounding communities uh, in the development of these districts is, is really a crucial part of the equation. So, uh, you know, the typical approach to community engagement, you know, when you're talking about development review in a city, as a developer, whether it's a private company or university or maybe even the municipality itself, uh, creates a nearly complete vision on its own, uh, sometimes with a designer, sometimes not. Um, and then it goes through a, a community process of uh, public meetings and they ask the community what they think. The community usually objects. Uh, and then depending on the system, the developer may need to mitigate the negative consequences of, of their development or provide some kinds of community benefits. Um, so I think you know, what we're starting to see in some places though is a more proactive uh, community engagement approach uh, that seems to be, you know, resulting in some better outcomes. So really it's about starting by, starting the whole process by engaging uh, as broad a cross section of the community as possible. Um, sometimes even in observing and evaluating the, the spaces within the district uh, and then reimagining the, the sites. Um, I know the developer and designer uh, can actually keeps the community involved throughout the process in a creative, collaborative capacity rather than just a purely reactive advisory sort of role. Um, so, so one example of this uh, is the Buffalo Niagara uh, Medical Camp Campus uh, in Buffalo, New York. Um, and you know, ironically, medical centers are often these not very healthy places to work, uh, nor are they very healthy neighbors. Um, you know, they create these, these areas that are not dense, not walkable, not mixed use, uh, and, and make it harder for the communities around them to really live a healthy lifestyle. So uh, partly to address this, uh, the BNMC uh, ha has actually taken on a new strategy that they call uh, Four Neighborhoods, One Community. And so the idea is that they're going to, um, you know, really use some of the, the big benefits that anchors like a medical uh, campus can provide uh, like direct funding, their clout, their purchasing power, their foot traffic, uh, and useful services, and and better plan plan it in an integrated way with with its surrounding neighborhoods. So this this effort started in 2007, and the idea is to to integrate the campus with its adjacent neighborhoods, which which are downtown Buffalo, uh, Allentown, and the Fruit Belt. So the process uh, brought together a, a wide variety of stakeholders to identify the the unique strengths and challenges in each area and the, the areas where there could be some mutual benefit. Um, and and these, these neighborhoods really did vary a lot. So Allentown is a, a relatively affluent historic district, while the Fruit Belt is a lower income area uh, that was affected by urban renewal. 
Um, so in both places, they've really tried to kind of ease the transition between the campus and, and the surrounding areas, um, you know, particularly uh, along Main Street, which is the border between the district and, uh, and Allentown. Uh, they're trying to really make it a Main Street again and add uh, more retail, more infill, um, and try and uh, make the institutional uses play better uh, with, with the retail uses that are across from them. And they're working with a lot of local partners to do this. Um, but in the Fruit Belt neighborhood, there's, this is, I think, where, it's, where we can learn the most in terms of gentrification. Um, they've really made an effort to, to bring the community to the table on an ongoing basis. So they created an advisory board uh, to review the neighborhood plan for that area and how it integrates with the district, uh, which will then be reviewed by the municipality. Um, but then on the, on the housing front, uh, they've actually created a land bank um, to, to buy up uh, empty parcels within the district uh, and a community development corporation um, that, that can actually start developing those into all, all sorts of different things for, uh, that the community sort of sets forth in its plan. Uh, and they have other policies as well to promote home ownership in the area. And all of these can be potentially used to sort of mitigate the effects of gentrification. Um, and then much like Philly, they also have a collaborative workforce development strategy, uh, and they have a, a collaborative public health strategy as well, involving health education, screenings, clinics, and, and so on. Um, Jennifer, could you, could you go ahead one slide? Yep. So then, um, you know, within these sort of broader district plans as well, there's also really specific strategic places that, that can be uh, located and programmed for, for mutual benefit for both a, a district and, and a surrounding community. Um, so, you know, while, while providing concrete economic and social outcomes, some of these places can also, you know, really address some of the cultural side of gentrification, which goes back to that feeling that, you know, a neighborhood's not in control of change. Um, so, you know, these specific locations can really reflect the values and the culture of, of the existing community. Um, so, you know, for just as an example, uh, anchors could really use, again, some of their, their vast resources in some ways uh, to address food deserts in nearby neighborhoods. So this is an example of a, a grocery store uh, on the edge of the Philadelphia Innovation District um, that, that, you know, is, is right between the university, what, two university campuses and then uh, a nearby neighborhood. Um, and there's, there are similar examples of initiatives like this in actually in Harlem uh, between Com Columbia University and its adjacent neighborhood, uh, where it was really intentionally about making a place that both students and, and uh, local neighbors could, could shop. Um, and, you know, if there isn't enough demand for a grocery store, there's also a lot of smaller strategies like, say, a farmer's market or a grocery truck that could help bridge that gap. Um, however, any, any of these investments, right, anything like this can be interpreted either as a, a way to really work with the neighborhood or as a frontier for gentrification. I think that's really important. It, it really all hinges on how much trust has been built up through community engagement. Um, so I think that the really interesting thing about these sort of smaller local uh, locations that you can really invest in is that they actually... Um, can be an opportunity to build up that trust uh, and a positive working relationship with the community. Um, you know, one of the biggest problems with community engagement is that uh, so often it's just, it, people just feel like it's so much talk, right? Um, that it takes too long for implementation to occur or that there just isn't any follow through or that people's uh, recommendations are not listened to. There's no sort of official capacity, but uh, smaller, you know, placemaking projects in particular, say in a park, on the border of a district can be done in a matter of months. So there's a really tight loop between that community engagement and seeing the results and, and the community can be very directly involved in the implementation rather than just consult it. Next slide, please. So uh, just to, to end the presentation, there's, this is one example where that I think really brings together a lot of these different ideas. It's called the Roxbury Innovation Center. Uh, in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, so it was founded in 2015 as a, a public-private partnership between the city of Boston and uh, an organization called the Venture Cafe Foundation to assist with economic development in Roxbury, uh, the Roxbury neighborhood, through uh, resources for entrepreneurs and innovators. Um, and I think the, the, one of the really interesting things is that Venture Cafe uh, is a network-building organization that 
uh, originated in, in one of the city's two innovation districts and, and now has another location in the other innovation district. So this is the, their first location outside of a traditional innovation district that are these sort of employment hubs of high tech um, businesses. Um, and Roxbury is one of the most underserved neighborhoods in Boston. So it's, it's really quite a leap for them. Um, so the, the, this organization is located in a municipal building at a Y intersection in the heart of Dudley Square uh, in, in the Roxbury neighborhood. And this is really a, a location that has the potential to be a real retail center for the whole neighborhood. Uh, it's also adjacent to a bus terminal that connects it to the, the rest of the city. Next slide. So um, the Innovation Center itself is about 3,300 square feet, it includes offices, classrooms, and a, and a fabrication lab. Um, and it shares the building with the Boston Public Schools, um, uh, who they, they actually collaborate with quite a bit on the tech curriculum in Boston. Uh, and that use really helps drive foot traffic past them. Uh, all sorts of people go to, to the Boston Public Schools offices uh, who wouldn't necessarily know about the Innovation Center. Um, and they can get their kids involved with it. Um, so the, the building also has retail and restaurants on the ground floor, which you can see in the upper right there. Um, and the, all of those, those uh, retail uses are actually sourced from the surrounding neighborhood. Um, and they have this really synergistic sort of uh, relationship with uh, the Innovation Center in the sense that they actually often cater their events. Um, and they really, the, the Innovation Center is always trying to connect their partners with, with their uh, the retail on the ground floor. So the in Innovation Center uh, has a var huge variety of programs, um, everything from accelerator programs for food, fashion, and high tech, uh, entrepreneurship and business classes, uh, coding classes, um, funding and granting opportunities for, for creative entrepreneurs, um, and a lot of youth programming as well, uh, again, connecting with the Boston Public School. Um, they also have a monthly uh, networking event called Cafe Nights, which is exactly the same as what Venture Cafe does in the Innovation Districts. Um, and one of the most interesting sort of initiatives that they're currently working on is really connecting this location of Venture Cafe with uh, the other locations throughout the city, in Kendall Square and the Seaport District in particular. Um, and so they're doing this through cross-promotion. They have an online platform. Uh, the fact that they're connected by transit doesn't hurt. Um, and the idea is that entrepreneurs from Roxbury uh, can, can kind of get their feet wet with all of these different um, skills and, and opportunities at the Roxbury Innovation Center, and then go to other places in the city and connect with their peers there um, and connect with other you know, potential funders and, and gain other skills. Um, and meanwhile, venture capitalists from, from the innovation districts can kind of broaden beyond their usual suspects and, and diversify their portfolios by coming to Roxbury. Um, so it's, it's a, this is still a pretty young organization. It's only been around for a couple of years, but I really think it's one worth watching. Uh, I think it's one of the most promising place-based experiments that I've seen for connecting this changing geography we've been talking about uh, with efforts at, at more inclusive growth. So uh, I think that's it from me. So thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Nate. Thank you, Jennifer. While we're waiting for Rachel to get her um, uh, her uh, slides up. I just want to remind people to send in your questions. We have quite a few good questions that we will come back to at the end of the the uh, webinar. So please keep sending them in. Thank you, Kate. I hope everyone can hear me okay and see the slides up. Please feel free to interrupt if either of those things are not happening. Um, Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I'm really honored to be here. Um, thanks to America Walks for extending this opportunity to me and to Prevention Institute. Um, as Kate said, my name is Rachel Bennett and I am an Associate Program Manager here at Prevention Institute. My own background is in both public health and urban and regional planning uh, with a focus on transportation planning. So I'm always glad to be back with um, transportation nerds and uh, pedestrian advocates, I feel like, um, feel right at home. And um, here at Prevention Institute, my work really focuses on embedding health equity 
into all transportation and land use related decisions. That's one among many things that Prevention Institute as an organization does. We are a national nonprofit organization based in Oakland, California, which is where I'm located, but also have offices in Los Angeles, Houston, and Washington, DC. And we are working with a range of partners locally, statewide in California and nationally to really fundamentally change the norms of many, many fields whose work contributes to public health and public safety. Really, we're trying not just to ensure that the healthy choice is the easy choice, but to ensure that all communities have conditions that support their health and safety. So I'm gonna be sharing some of our work from a recent report that we just uh, published. It's available on our website, preventioninstitute.org. And just because of time limitations, you know, there's only so much that I can share this morning, this afternoon. Um, so I do encourage you to download the report. Um, it features a lot of great work from our partners and um, a lot of additional resources and literature in case you'd like to learn more. The report and really a lot of our work um, explores uh, attention we're seeing in our work as public health folks, and I think probably many of you are facing as well, which is really grappling with this question of how can we improve community conditions in ways that support health without contributing to gentrification and displacement. In many ways, um, some of what we're seeing now playing out in communities, particularly urban areas, but also regions, it's not new. Um, we've seen displacement happen over and over across generations, um, precipitated by a number of different forces sort of in the land use realm, whether that's urban renewal, whether that's segregation or redlining. Um, and what we want to ensure is that the healthy communities movement is a part of the solution rather than having those unintended consequences. So our work at Prevention Institute is really informed and shaped by many partners in Los Angeles and in beyond. Um, and I just wanna give a quick nod to our Healthy Equitable Active Land Use Network partners. It's a group of organizations based in LA who come together really across fields and across approaches, all grappling with this question of how can we promote policy and systems change to fundamentally embed health and health equity in the way business is done in the transportation world, in the planning world, and beyond. This is a list of our core partners, um, and I'm so glad that Maria Sippen will be joining us as well and speaking. Um, she works with an organization called Multicultural Communities for Mobility, an incredible community-based organization in LA who many of our close partners have worked with. So Maria, I'm excited to hear you share more about your work. So what I want to focus my time on today is really this nexus of healthy communities and displacement and thinking about how can we take more of a prevention approach, again, to ensure community conditions support health for all. Um, you know, many of us know that in the last 15 years or so, there's been a growing body of research that's really shown that where we live influences our health. And this has sparked a huge amount of new investment in things like Safe Routes to School initiatives or urban trails, complete streets, um, transit-oriented development and reinvestments in transit, things like parklets and plazas, placitas, playgrounds, and farmers markets, makers markets, community gardens, grocery stores, and all of that. These investments are by and large intended to promote health for the residents who live in the communities. But we also see that at the same time, you know, we're really grappling with continued aftershocks of a national housing crisis. We're seeing reurbanization of our cities. Um, we all know that there are rising rates of income inequality, and we're seeing growing rates of homelessness in our cities and regions. Um, it's also really a shifting jobs landscape right now. All of these forces combined with these new healthy communities investments can set in motion a process that attracts more affluent residents and businesses to relocate into you know, what was formerly affordable property, affordable housing, and this ultimately pushes out 
low-income families, people of color who may have been there for a long time and have been working very hard to bring more health-promoting resources to their community and get investment for that. So I feel like, you know, it's really no wonder that there's a lot of skepticism among community residents, many of whom may have fought hard and for years to bring things like trails or more walkable streets or parks to really ask, you know, is this new development meant for me and my family, or is it ultimately going to set in motion a process that pushes us out? Um, from a health perspective, you know, we know from the healthy communities research that when people live in communities that don't support their health, not only may their quality of life be lower because they're at increased risk for illnesses and injuries, but actually people have a lower lifespan. So we see in Philly, for example, you know, kids who grow up just five miles apart from one another have a life expectancy difference of 15 years. And that relates directly to how safe and how healthy their communities are, how much access they have to health promoting resources and so on and so forth. So really what we're about at Prevention Institute and what my work is about is not just trying to promote health in transportation and in planning and land use work, but really health equity. So I just, I'm gonna read this because I feel like it's such an important concept that all of us who work in the walking movement understand and center in our work. Health equity means that every person, regardless of who they are, the color of their skin, their level of education, their gender or sexual identity, whether or not they have a disability, the job that they have or the neighborhood they live in, has an equal opportunity to achieve optimal health. So I'm so glad America Walks is hosting these sessions and is really elevating equity in the work that they are doing and that we as a national learning community are taking this issue on more front and center in our work. I am gonna go quickly through a number of ideas here that are featured in our report. And again, I wanna, sh I wanna encourage everybody to look at the report just in the interest of time. We don't have as much time as I would like for us to, to get to today. And I do wanna leave enough time for Maria. But I want to underscore that the way that we are approaching the issues of gentrification and displacement is really from a public health framework. Um, we see ourselves as helping to carry a torch that many, many people have been carrying for a long time. Community organizers, affordable housing specialists, legal experts who have been working on these issues for many, many years. We think that health and health equity can bring a useful frame to this and can really build an even broader constituency of people who see things like displacement as one of their issues. And I think that there is a very important place for the walking movement here. So I just want to underscore part of the reason that we as a public health organization see that this is so important is because we know that displacement impacts health. People's ability to stay in their homes and in their communities, you know, rooted to their social networks, it depends on the availability of housing, the quality and the location and the affordability of that housing. And when you don't have access to affordable housing, not only are you at increased risk for exposure to environmental pollutants or toxins or things like that, but you also may be forced to relocate to a less healthy community. Again, maybe a less walkable community, maybe a community where there's less access to quality health care or schools or medical care or your social connections, your faith community and all that. All of these things undermine health. So I share this both because I think it's really important that all of us understand it, but also I think a lot of advocates that I talk to want to know how to help make the case that these issues are important maybe to elected officials or skeptical developers or whoever, whoever the people may be. And I think that health can really be a valuable tool in that toolkit and can help convince some people who may not really understand their role or the relevance of these issues. Certainly those who are working on racial justice and economic justice and housing, again, have long been doing that work. We wanna sort of help broaden the tent so that more and more people are thinking about how to prevent and mitigate displacement from happening. 
I think, you know, this quote from our partner, Isela Gracian, who runs ELAC, East LA Community Corporation in East Los Angeles, really captures the essence of this. You know, displacement wouldn't be such an issue if we knew people were moving to a better, healthier place, but so often that is not the case. So I'm going to share just a couple of examples that I think are interesting from our work in Los Angeles and from what we're hearing out in the field. You're going to see me scroll through a number of slides that I'm not going to take time to cover today, but I did want them to be available to folks for downloading after the presentation. And again, in the full report, you know, all of this is, is spelled out, but also we have some links to jurisdictions across the country that have really uh, piloted these models or that have had these strategies in place for a long time. So if you're looking to learn about who's done what well and where, I suggest starting with the report. It's a great place. Um, and again, you know, what we are really trying to do here is to connect affordable housing and healthy communities movements. I, I want to say if there's maybe two things you take away from my remarks. One would be I hope that everybody, no matter what you work on in your own work, can think about finding who works on affordable housing and community organizing and development work in your own community and find ways to connect your work to theirs and help use your constituents and your resources and, and the megaphone that you have to help support their work. And the second is to think about what you can do in your own work to help proactively prevent and mitigate displacement. We're trying to identify some points of entry for people who may not know exactly where to start, but see that these issues are playing out in their work and in their communities. So one of the tools that we have developed at Prevention Institute is a framework called the Spectrum of Prevention, which is really a public health framework that says in order to address complex public health issues, whether it's gun violence, childhood obesity, traffic injuries, or displacement, we need a comprehensive approach. We need to be working at all of these different levels. Not that every single person or every single institution or organization needs to be working at all these levels, but we need to be working together in complementary approaches so that anybody doing individual behavior change or outreach and engagement with communities, that their work is feeding into policy change and policy change is informed by the perspectives of individual community residents and of community-based coalitions and so on. So I'm going to focus on two quick examples. Um, again, not wanting to spend too much time this morning, but one is really at the level of influencing policy and legislation, which is so important because it shapes conditions for entire populations. And the example that I want to talk about quickly is to um, embed anti-displacement incentives in public infrastructure bonds. Here in California, my home state, our legislature just passed enabling legislation that will put forward a public infrastructure bond next year on the ballot um, to support parks and water infrastructure projects. And there is language in the bill that health equity and park equity and water equity advocates were able to get in there that says to the extent possible, grants from this bond will be prioritized for projects that advance anti-displacement solutions if it's likely that building a new park is going to increase housing costs. So this is parks legislation and water legislation, seemingly has nothing to do with affordable housing, but it's proactively anticipating that with infusion of new resources into communities where there have been long-standing park inequities, that we should be considering the potential for housing costs to go up. And to the extent possible, any project that considers that up front and proposes solutions to that is going to get preferential funding. This is the kind of a model you can take, you know, for local bonds or for regional or statewide bonds in your own work. One other quick example, and apologies for scrolling through so quickly here, but um, is uh, that I, I wanted to focus on is just at the level of uh, educating providers, which is kind of a wonky term, but basically it means um, working with anybody who's trusted in communities, whether this is community-based organization staff, faith leaders, healthcare professionals, staff of public agency, teachers, what have you. And I highlight this one because I imagine that for many of us walking advocates, 
we have an audience of folks like this. And what I want to encourage is that all of us use the reach that we already have with these trusted individuals and with the community residents that they work with, young people and so on and so forth, to make the case that our work on walking and on pedestrian advocacy and on community safety and health is connected to the issues of gentrification and displacement and to really encourage them to learn more about the issues and to think creatively about how we can, in our own walking work, help to connect to those issues and support progress. So the idea is not that we as walking advocates do it all, but that we are part of a more comprehensive solution. Um, like a lot of major public health issues, None of us can solve the problems of gentrification and displacement on our own. These forces are greater than any one sector or institution or even community. But together, we really have this huge collective capacity to drive policy and systems change, to empower local residents, and to support healthy communities for all. So I'm just going to leave you with a sort of a, a question and a challenge to think about what steps you can take in your own work and or your partnerships to improve community conditions to support health without contributing to displacement. And again, I invite you to check out the report. It's on our website, preventioninstitute.org. And I look forward to any questions and to keeping this discussion going beyond just the hour today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rachel. And just so everyone knows, and while Maria's getting her, her slides up, we will be sending the link to the report in the follow-up email that you get for this webinar. And it is a superb report, and I encourage all of you to read it. Okay, Maria. Thank you. Hi, my name is Maria Sippen. I've been volunteering for MCM for four years now. We partner with communities, cities, consulting firms, and transit agencies to advance equity priorities by bringing people together and strategizing, uh, making more walkable, bikeable, transit-friendly places for communities of color are important to us, uh, which is why we're in the mix. And today, I want to emphasize the value of community groups in all of our work, that, that we shouldn't be an afterthought and expected to perform at the point when projects are over budget or a crisis needs to be repaired. So thank you again to Kate and America Walks for inviting me to join this webinar, uh, where I have the honor and privilege of, of sharing a story about a little humble organization that could. So here we go. Uh, MCM, previously known as Ciudad de Luces, City of Lights, was founded by young people of color who operated within a well-established bike advocacy organization in 2008. Our founders, Alison Manos and Antonio Lugo, wanted to move away from mainstream white-centered initiatives to focus on racial inclusion, uh, utilitarian urban cycling, low-income workers, legal rights, and Spanish language programs. The team was equipped with um, dozens of battery-operated bike lights, and, and they went out to distribute sets to people biking at night without them. This became a successful program now called Operation Firefly under the Los Angeles County Bicycle Coalition. It's important to point out that the founders of MCM were, were really serious about making this um, the shift from being intentional about race and prioritizing the experiences people of color have on bikes that weren't being acknowledged in advocacy then. Uh, this continues to be the basis of, of MCM's work today and why we center our efforts um, for bike ped and transit advocacy on communities of color. MCM naturally partnered um, with day labor centers and bike co-ops in Los Angeles and, and developed culturally responsive programming that received local and national recognition. Um, we were clearly onto something, but we were constrained by the structure we were operating under. So eventually, uh, MCM separated from the Bike Coalition to pursue and protect funding that would allow us to create the kind of programs um, that we wanted and exercise our values more freely. It was really important for us then 
uh, to create an organization with autonomy uh, made up of team members who were aligned with our mission of serving marginalized groups and to address intersecting issues in the lives of low-income people of color that were being ignored in LA, like uh, gentrification, getting bike lanes in low-income neighborhoods, and police racially profiling cyclists. We launched an organization made up of volunteers of mostly young POC, uh, pitching in to keep MCM running with a, a working board and committees. We operated on this DIY system, um, everything without an office, um, even to today, fundraising, development, program planning, marketing, outreach, you name it. Um, we had no executive positions and no professional experiences or degrees were required here. Uh, today we fight to be proactive and to sustain ourselves and, and to raise the value of community participation every day. This collective leadership model isn't perfect, uh, but it's essential to creating an organizational environment that's more responsive to community members, but also paves the way for young people to thrive beyond this active transportation focused work. And that's what I'm most proud of as someone leading this organization. MCM proudly regards itself as this this incubator for young leaders um, and you know having agency supportive peers and these opportunities to shape our neighborhoods really goes a long way with young people we we work hard to, to, to sustain that at mcm it's important for us to compensate our team members for their work and we're still aiming to provide stable employment to more people someday our team members are skilled and effective at their community engagement and knowledge sharing and advising roles because we bring our life experiences into the room and we have a deep connection to the communities we work in. These identities, experiences, and connection to the community are valuable, especially in transportation and anti-displacement work. Trust doesn't happen overnight, and um, we continue to remind people that. Government agencies aren't able to approach marginalized community members with the care they deserve, and, and you know, honestly, Black and brown communities may be averse to those interactions anyway, uh, no matter how well-intentioned, they are because historical wrongs and, and this track record of a lack of transparency and abandonment. MCM has to be conscious um, of those wrongs too. And we, we gotta make sure that we don't continue this cycle of mistrust and abuse in our communities. We are not exempt from that as a community org and we have to be aware of it always. So MCM recognizes that even though we're a grassroots operation um, with limited financial resources and staff capacity, we, we have power and we have the power to build relationships and break them. We have the social capital, uh, professional networks that, that help us advance our agenda. And even with all the community assets that we have, we need, um, government agencies, elected officials, high-level nonprofits, and private entities to share their power and resources. The same people charged with creating these so-called um, vibrant communities can be the ones who destroy the culturally rich black and brown neighborhoods that have been thriving all along. So if you fall under that powerful umbrella, um, what are you willing to give up, share, or change in your process to be more inclusive and to work toward equitable outcomes? Who are you inviting to the table and how much do you value their participation? Uh, Co-opting community resources happens all too often and we know because we're subcontracted and we get hired to do stuff and we do it with very little. And we need people in power to recognize that communities have power. Our work's not just about getting people to fill out, you know, these surveys or getting more people walking or biking. We have to protect where people live and ensure that they aren't being uprooted just, you know, just because um, people can pay more for coffee or studio apartments or, you know, they have the choice to be car free and can tweet their electeds when they have some kind of complaint about parking or whatever it is. 
So we, we have the opportunity in everything that we do to address racism, displacement, wage theft, deaths at the hands of police, and criminalizing people of color, starting with how we operate and how we treat our collaborators and community members. If you can easily exclude a community group from your project or, for example, underpay them for their participation or forget to even translate these materials in their language, ignoring their needs when a massive development is underway becomes even easier to do. Um, displacement and gentrification uh, thrive on that kind of apathy and it's so easy that you know people don't care care about us. MCM wants people um, to care more and we want to um, make it nearly impossible for them to forget our community members because we remind our collaborators every single day that we're still here after Ciudad de Luces, and even you know, after five years of being this little baby nonprofit um, with our collaborative leadership model. So this emphasis on efficiency and um, white-centered aesthetics, micromanaging your community partners and enforcing these ill-fitting urban planning conventions is the wrong way to go. And we'll be the ones to tell you that. Stop doing it now and cut it out and truly listen. Truly invite people to be equal partners at the table and in the way that funding is allocated. So for every project that we take on, we learn something new. Um, growing pains are real. Five years ago, we're rebuilding and today we're trying to sustain ourselves. Um, in a recent project in Boyle Heights, um, concerned with um, piloting complete streets interventions and included some tactical urbanism elements, we uh, reinforce the importance that getting community members involved very early in the process is a requirement. And you have to understand the context of what's happening in their neighborhoods, especially Boyle Heights, and, and don't dismiss their concerns of rapidly rising rents um, and improvements that seem to be coinciding with white people moving in and white businesses coming in. Here's another recent one, our hashtag bike share equity project with deliverables that involved um, identifying equity gaps in our local bike share system. And I'll be the first to tell you that it's so difficult to be critical of programs that are beloved and favored by your peers. It's so hard to do good work when funding goes to administrative costs and community engagement activities get far less than what is needed to be truly successful. Um, check out our videos on Twitter on hashtag bike share equity. We've got plenty of them and we'd love for you to share them too. Um, let me skip that one. And finally, we have this project that was a Vision Zero related event series that leveraged our community assets and partnered with community groups. Uh, with a generous timeline to plan and um, by our partners providing resources to community groups, the event was a success. So for all these projects, our next step is to not fade into the oblivion and to ensure that the dialogue continues, that we continue having a seat at the table in, in the rooms that value us, that community members aren't just accessories to these initiatives. We, we don't want like all these um, feel good milestones and all the props that we get on Twitter to really get away from our ongoing work and together, we as coalitions and collaborators can reform policies and put an end to traffic injuries and deaths and um, develop equitable and inclusive in interventions that improve biking and walking in our neighborhoods. So finally, um, boost the power of communities. We are all obligated to. Thank you. Thank you, Maria, and thank you to all of our panelists. We have far more questions uh, than we will be able to get to, but I do think we have time for one or two. And this is a big question that I'd like for each of our panelists to answer, if they could. So how would you handle, or perhaps give us one example, of a situation where community residents say they do not want things that would make their community healthier, a grocery store, improved transit, bike lanes, sidewalks, because they worry about the risk of displacement 
and our, our, our participant says, this is not hypothetical. We hear this is happening. Um, so let's just start with the Jennifer, would you, can you give us one or two um, ideas for uh, how to handle that situation? Hmm. I, I mean, I might not, I think there might be actually some of the other panelists might be better poised to answer this particular question. I think from, from our perspective, um, it, you know, a lot of this really comes back to, to how you're creating communities where people are engaged in the growth that's happening. And if that's, you know, growth, including, eco, you know, economic growth in an area, um, growth that's the provision of new goods and services in an area, growth, you know, in, in terms of the provision of, of other types of amenities. I think it really comes down to how are you really ensuring that people are engaged in the processes and the decision making um, as that's as those things are on the table and as they're happening, um, and also ensuring that people can, you know, can be able to access the economic opportunities so that they're at less risk for displacement. Um, you know, I think one of the important things to keep in mind here is when we talk about affordability issues, there's two sides of the coin. One is cost, but the other side of the coin is, is income and the ability to, to, to pay those costs. And I think oftentimes the conversation tends to focus a lot on the cost side of the equation. And, and at least what we see sometimes in our work, that's a lot of the questions we get. It's about you know, change that's happening to people. Um, as opposed to the flip side of that, which is saying, how do we um, focus not just on the costs, but on the income side of the equation and how we're tying people into the economy um, as it grows through workforce, through business development opportunities, so that they can manage displacement better and be in a position to be able to take advantage of the new grocery store or the park or other types of improvements in their communities. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Nate, do you have a, 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 an example or a recommendation? Yeah, I mean, I think, I, th I think Jennifer kind of hit most of the points that I would make, but I do think that, you know, you need to really start with what, identifying what the community thinks improvement looks like, um, you know, coming in with the solutions already sort of uh, pre-made is not is not going to put you in a good sit situation to really work with the community. Um, so I think that's that's definitely number one. And then I really loved uh, Rachel's sort of point about this idea of uh, risk and resilience factors. And it may be that before you really start, uh, you know, investing in those kinds of changes uh, or concurrently with that, you need to be b building up more resilience and mitigating the risk factors as much as possible and working with the community. To, to actually do that. Thank you. Rachel? Thanks for the question. Um, so I think that it's really about asking who's leading the effort. You know, is, in the example of a grocery store, is this a, a developer who's coming and doing speculative real estate development, or is this a community co-op bringing healthy food to their neighborhood? Um, obviously, there's many, many shades of gray in between, but um, I think that's one thing to think about. Um, and, you know, people who control some of the levers of whether projects move forward and on what timeline and what community benefits there need to be from that, they should be considering who is leading the effort and who stands to benefit from it. Um, I think, you know, to some extent change is inevitable, but I think that all of the people who have some power in the system of development moving forward or not can and should be asking what are the health impacts of this for the community that's there? What are the equity impacts of this? And, um, you know, if, for example, such a project is to move forward, there's an opportunity to say, okay, there's going to be a local hire requirement. There's going to be a living wage requirement. You know, certainly for mega projects, there's a lot of room to do that. Smaller projects, you know, that may depend on the jurisdiction. But there's lots that can be done. You know, maybe it's the co-location of a new shopping center with an affordable housing development or a policy put into place that there's going to be no net loss of housing units 
uh, that are affordable in the process of new development. Or maybe, you know, any community benefits go to a fund that supports other local businesses during the construction process so that they aren't impacted so much. So it's not exactly a full answer to your question, but I, I guess my answer is there are steps that can be taken to help mitigate. And I will just say, I think we really need to not just listen to people, you know, those of us who have a role and some power in the system, not just listen to people, but also insist that every community should have access to the resources that support their health and understand that it's on us to think about how we can help ensure that that happens. Thank you. And Maria? I don't have much to add from that except just generally don't put profits over people and to really think about the history that these communities have had and what they've gone through. You know, I think we have to not sell them out and we have to make sure that we keep our electeds accountable. We really have to put money into these communities, not just because we want to attract new residents or make places look like the aesthetic that we're so much pursuing every day, but really care about growing um, what's already there. Thank you. And thank, thanks to all of our panelists. You have sparked quite a bit of discussion. We will be sharing your questions with the panelists and asking them to um, uh, provide answers, which we will put online for you. You will be getting a follow-up with the resources that were mentioned here today and a few more that we have um, available. Uh, thank you for taking part today. Also, uh, join us next time. We have in December, we have a, a webinar on turning data into action. We have some new uh, study information that we'll be sharing with you and, and working with you on how do we take this and make a difference with it. I cannot say thank you enough to Jennifer, Nate, Rachel, and Maria. They've really brought us a lot to think about and to help us try to continue to tear apart this very vexing issue of how do we create and evolve uh, communities while making sure everyone is getting an equitable share of the benefits. Thanks so much, and we will uh, see you next time online.